mentioned that at the, the fall of Jerusalem, 586 BC, uh, it is a physically traumatical situation. Obviously, um, the massive destruction of the city of Jerusalem, the deportation of many, the majority of the people to Babylon, um, all of the stuff that we talk about trauma, you know, post-traumatic syndrome, all of those kinds of things are what they would have been experiencing. And we need to recognize that Jeremiah is speaking into that kind of context. I also mentioned there is the theological upheaval which takes place. Um, you know, because all of the, the tangible symbols of God's covenant relationship with his people, the Davidic king, the land, uh, the temple, the city of Jerusalem, all of those tangible symbols were now taken away. And so it raises all of these theological questions uh, at the end of, um, you know, was the Babylonian gods more powerful than our God that this happened? Uh, where is God in the midst of it? Does this mean the complete end to the covenant relationship with God? All of these theological questions are raised. But prior to that, in the years leading up to that, um, need to realize that Jeremiah is speaking against a, it's referred to as a popular theology, um, that the people, most of the people of Judah are holding to this kind of popular theology. That's their theological perspective. And Jeremiah as a prophet gives these prophetic words which are contradictory to this popular theology. And so the people were, were in understanding these historical events based on their popular theology Whereas Jeremiah is coming along and saying, no, this is the proper way to interpret all of these historical events. Let me clarify kind of, kind of what that is, the difference between the two. There are five areas in which the people had a different perspective than what the prophetic perspective of Jeremiah was. Deals with the covenant, the land, the Davidic kingship, Jerusalem, and the temple. Those are the five key areas where there seems to be a difference. Um, on the one hand, the popular theology with respect to the covenant is God's blessings are unconditional. It doesn't matter how we act. We are God's covenant people. We will always be God's covenant people. And it doesn't matter whether we sin or anything else, God will bless us. Okay? Jeremiah's perspective that he says over and over again, no, the blessings of God are contingent upon your obedience. God blesses the righteous, but God punishes those who have sinned. Okay? So two different perspectives of what the covenant relationship between God and his people were. Um, the popular theology, God has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> Raises an interesting question. In the book of Jeremiah, what is probably the verse most everybody knows? Behold, I have plans for you Right, Jeremiah 29. And that verse, I have, God says, I have plans for you for good, not for evil, gets quoted over and over within the contemporary church. We hold a very similar to this. All that God has in store for us is good. It doesn't matter how we live. It doesn't matter how spiritual we are in the church. God will always bless us. And some people would carry it. We can actually live in sin. But as long as we've accepted Christ into our lives, God will bless us. Okay? 
And Jeremiah says, no, you will be blessed only if you continue to live out a righteous life in relationship to the covenant. Um, and the context, we'll come back to that Jeremiah 29 passage. Uh, we quote it in that context, but it's spoken to people who are in exile, who have already experienced the judgment of God. And God says, I've got something good for you beyond the punishment. But we don't read it that way. We read Jeremiah 29 as God will never punish us. God has a wonderful plan for our life and nothing can derail that plan. Um, not even our own sinfulness or disobedience. Um, by the way, if you see some similarities between, if your the theology between Calvinism and Wesleyanism here, you're probably seeing correctly. <laughs> anyway, um, and I probably, nobody knows what Calvinism or Wesleyanism, right? <laughs> anyway, should. they should. <laughs> okay. Um, another difference in perspective over the land. God had promised the land through Abraham, and because God had promised the land, nobody could ever take the land away from them. It's a promise from God. How can God go back on a promise? And Jeremiah's prophetic messages are, no, possession of the land is contingent upon your, the people's obedience. You will remain in the land as long as you are obedient. If you're disobedient, God is under no obligation for you to stay in the land. Okay? Um, there might be some relevance to that as to a perspective of the right of Israel to the land, modern land. Do they have a right to the land if they are not part of God's covenant relationship? Anyway, that's a totally different issue. Uh, the other thing was the kingship. Second Samuel uh, chapter 7, God had promised to David, you will have someone on the throne for part time. No, forever. So if God promised this forever, then it's got to be forever. Which means there will always, 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 always be a ruler from the line of David over God's people. It's a promise of God. How can it not happen? Jeremiah's perspective, though, is the promises to David could be suspended if the people and the king are disobedient to God. It's not an unconditional promise. There is a contingency to the promise. The fourth thing is Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem is chosen by God to be the city during the time of David. It's the capital of Judah. And what it developed, are, uh, it's referred to as the inviability of Zion, uh, that Jerusalem or Zion could never be violated in the sense of being captured or destroyed. Um, and you read some of the Psalms where God says, I'm encamped around the city of Jerusalem. In other words, if God is there, certainly no foreign enemy can ever capture the city of Jerusalem. And again, Jeremiah's perspective that he keeps reiterating in his prophecies is that God's defending the city is contingent upon the people's obedience. If the people are disobedient, God is under no obligation to defend the city. And the last one, the temple. The temple is the dwelling place of God. The very glory of God resides over the Holy of Holies in the temple. If that's so, then the people's perspective is that 
the site of the temple can never, nothing can ever happen to it because God is here. Jeremiah's perspective is, well, God's presence in the temple is contingent upon the people's obedience. And if God removes his presence from the temple, it becomes nothing other than a building which can certainly be destroyed. Uh, Ezekiel even carries this further in his vision where he actually sees the glory of God rise up from the temple, move to the eastern gate of the city of Jerusalem, and then move further east. That in Ezekiel, he sees the vision that God's presence has departed from the temple. Um, but it's that conflict of, of perspectives um, what the people were assuming would happen. So Jeremiah t comes out many times saying, you know, the prophets are saying, peace, peace, peace. Nothing bad is going to happen to the city of Jerusalem because it's based on these, this, these theological perspective and assumption that their God's people, nothing bad can ever happen to them or the land or the temple. And Jeremiah keeps going back more to the covenant. Uh, if you are obedient, God will bless. If you are disobedient, God will bring these calamities, curses upon you. And all the people all that the people were looking at was the positive side. Um, they, were, they were just, well, they're looking at the covenant as if it is a unconditional blessing from God. If we are in covenant relationship with God, mighty dear sir, um, a modern theological perspective, once I've accepted Christ into my life, it doesn't matter how I live or what I do because I am saved and will be eternally saved. Viewing it as a, a unconditional promise from God, as opposed to Wesleyan theology, uh, which says, no, we enter into a relationship to God, but we also need to continue in faithfulness with God because salvation is more a process and a relationship process in which we need to be obedient uh, for us to continue in our salvation. Um, so this is a very contemporary theological debate that, that goes on reflected even at the time of Jeremiah. Um, the Calvinism on the one side, once saved, always saved, and the Wesleyans on the other side, that you can remove yourself from the salvation process. Um, yeah, so am I describing Wesleyanism correctly? <laughs> I would say, that in my opinion, I think you correctly explained Wesleyan Armenianism I think the Calvinists would take some issue yeah. with that understanding because they would believe if you are saved, God would not al allow you to live in such a way. Right. So I think, yeah. but yes, yeah. but still it, it, you're correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, I'm, I'm making that, that connection simply to, to talk about, to show you the fact that these theological issues are not theological issues which they just had back in the 600s BC. These are ongoing theological debates and issues now, which, which how we interpret our relationship with God affects how we understand God's working in our lives. Um, yeah, anyway, so. Um, and this is going to be key to kind of understanding and see that Jeremiah is intentionally speaking against a different theological perspective. A perspective which, which puts, yeah, I've, God's got a wonderful plan for our life and nothing bad's going to happen. 
That's a theological perspective that Jeremiah keeps butting heads with over and over and over again. Okay? Um, so, yeah, kind of the people's assumptions. Um, people did not believe that they had sinned. At least to the degree to which they should receive any kind of severe punishment. In fact, Jeremiah quotes, quotes in Jeremiah 2.35, Yet you say, For I am innocent. Behold, I will enter into judgment with you on account of your saying, I have not sinned. Here the people are worshiping pagan gods. They're worshiping Baal. And yet their attitude is, We have not done anything wrong for which God should punish us. Um, Jeremiah's message is, no, you have sinned. And Jeremiah was trying to convince the people, bring them to an acknowledgement of their sin. Okay. Um, also, the people mistakenly assumed that even if they had sinned, because of Yahweh's covenant promises, he would not severely punish them. Uh, Jeremiah's message is, no, because you have sinned based on the covenant, punishment would come unless the people turn back and repent of their sin. Um, and again, the people's assumption, the people that saw no need to or refused to repent. Obviously, if you don't acknowledge that you've sinned, there's no reason to repent, Right? Or if you think that God is going to bless you in spite of what you do, there's no reason to repent. And Jeremiah's message of forewarning the people of, no, judgment is going to come. And so repeatedly calls the people to repentance um, so that to some degree the judgment would be altered. In other words, Again, the messages of Jeremiah are directly opposing the people. That's why God told Jeremiah in the call, they're going to fight against you. That they have such a solid stance in what they believe theologically, and it's be, you are coming along saying the total opposite, almost. Um, and so you're going to have this conflict um, and does have the conflict. Okay. Oops. Um, yeah, the people's, people's, the popular theology, they only focused on the promises to themselves. God promised that he would bless us. God promised that he would give to David, uh, someone from the line of David. God has promised his presence in the temple. And because God has promised, means forever. When God said to David, you will have someone from the line of David forever, that means forever, nonstop. And Jeremiah, again, as we mentioned, focuses on the conditions of the covenant. The covenant says, if you obey God, then God will bless. If you are disobedient, then God will punish. And so that's where, well, it's where Jeremiah focuses the message on believing from God that the people have sinned. Therefore, what is awaiting them is judgment, not blessing. Okay. On the standpoint of the people, that results in a false perspective, the false anticipation that God would deliver. We don't have to worry about the Babylonians coming in because God is on our side. God will deliver. Uh, we don't have to worry about the Babylonians coming in because God's promised his presence in the temple and God will spare the temple from any disaster. Um, and in the midst of this, because there, there are several occasions uh, of being people taken into exile prior to 586, uh, Daniel gets into exile in 605 in the first deportation by the Babylonians. Um, Ezekiel goes into exile in 597, the second exile into Babylon. 
And so they're saying the people that are living in exile, by the way, they sinned. <laughs> That's why God took them off into exile. But because God loves us and has a wonderful plan for our lives, they're going to all come back really soon. Within two years, in fact, is what Hananiah says. And Jeremiah's message, he's trying to dissuade them of this false sense of hope and says, no, disaster is coming. Jerusalem will be destroyed and the exiles aren't coming back here. You're going to go join them. Okay. And so this, this constant conflict between, between the perspective of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and I give you this information so that as you're reading through the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you can see this tension with the messages which, which he's proclaiming to the people. Okay? Um, one other short thing and we'll break for lunch. Um, within the book of Jeremiah, there are three types of literature. There are prophetic oracles which are in poetry, which comprise essentially the first 24 chapters. But then in Jeremiah you have biographical prose narratives uh, which speak about events which happen in the life of Jeremiah related to his prophetic ministry. And then you have a third type of literature, which are prophetic messages, which are in prose, in contrast to the type A literature, which is poetry. You now have prose sermons. Uh, and simply recognizing there are three different literary types of material um, in the book of Jeremiah. Um, people who study the book of Jeremiah are interested more in this kind of stuff than, than you necessarily need to know. But if, you run, if you're reading literature on Jeremiah and they talk about type A or type B or type C literary stuff, um, that's what they're talking about. The book of Jeremiah is hard to study in one sense in that it's not arranged nicely. We like a book which would start, okay, this is his first message, his second message, his third message, and on down through a chronological arranging of his messages from beginning to end. Book of Jeremiah has not that kind of arrangement at all. Um, it has a, an arrangement by theme or by kind of type of literature. The first 20 chapters 2 through 25 are all about judgment. God's going to bring judgment because of the people's sin. Suddenly shifts to but a thematic grouping of biological narrative related to Jeremiah's controversy with officials, kings and other officials and other prophets. Interspersed in that, after that, then you have chapters 30 through 33, which are, it's referred to as the book of consolation because it's, now the judgment has come, God does have a wonderful plan for your life. All of the hope of restoration, the new covenant and all of that, um, kind of, yeah, being the opposite of the oracles of judgment. But then suddenly in verse chapters 34 through 45, it turns back to more biographical material, but again, not arranged chronologically, but a more thematic because 34 to 39 is the reign of Jehoiakim and then Zedekiah, and then chapters 40 through 45 after uh, the fall of Jerusalem. But, um, a bunch of this takes place during the reign of Jehoiakim as well, but it's, yeah. Anyway, it's simply, and then a whole group of prophecies, 46 through 51, 
which are prophecies not directed toward Judah, not directed toward God's people, but they are oracles against the various nations, oracles against Egypt, oracles against uh, the nations just to the north, Tyre, uh, nations to the, to the east, Amman, um, and finally concluding with oracles against the nation of Babylon. Okay. And finally, at the end, the fall of Jerusalem, chapter 52. But again, they have been grouped according to topical groupings, not chronology. That's why it makes sometimes, again, the reading of Jeremiah difficult because, you know, things later in the book happen before things earlier in the book, and so it makes it hard. Um, so that's why in going through Jeremiah, I'm going through it more from a topical basis. I'm not even going to try to follow the outline of the book itself. But dealing with key repeated themes or topics in the book of Jeremiah, like Jeremiah's conflict with the political leadership, Jeremiah's conflicts with, with the false prophets, um, yeah, and dealing with it thematically, okay? And one last thing about, for your information on, on the book of Jeremiah, um, the Greek translation of Jeremiah, the Septuagint, uh, abbreviated LXX for 70, the Septuagint is an eighth shorter than the Hebrew text, which is referred to as the Masoretic text. Um, yeah, the Septuagint, the Greek translation, it's not that they've really eliminated anything out of the book of Jeremiah. They have just eliminated repetitions that are found in the book of Jeremiah. One of the things you'll, you'll find about Jeremiah, the text of Jeremiah that he has, he says the same thing over and over. <laughs> and he doesn't say it just once, he says it, you know, he's not content to say it once. He's got to say it two or three times. Well, the translation of the Septuagint, which is probably working off of a different original text, was shorter. It kind of eliminated all of those repetitions. So it's not that it's saying anything different. It's just a slightly condensed version of the book of Jeremiah. What we have, what we have in the English Bible, and I'm assuming the Estonian Bible, and need to verify whether the Russian Bible, I know that in the English and Estonian, we follow the Hebrew text. Uh, anybody who, does the Russian follow the Hebrew text or does it follow the Septuagint? Does anybody know? Okay, if in reading the book of Jeremiah, you're following my versification and reading in, in the Russian Bible and it has another, you know, you've got different versification or something, then it's probably following the Septuagint. But uh, the other thing is with the Septuagint, it has a different arrangement of chapters. Okay, um, so for example, um, where the oracles of nations is in chapters 46. That's an easy way to figure out where the Russian Bible, or chapter 46 through 46 through 51, uh, are they speaking against the foreign nations? Okay, then the Russian Bible is following the Hebrew text as well. Because in the Septuagint, these come right after chapter 25. All of these chapters against the four nations are inserted at the end of chapter 25 before our chapter 26, so that the chapter divisions in the Septuagint, chapter numbering is completely different than our Hebrew text as well. Again, this is not something you, you need to significantly remember for understanding the book of Jeremiah. I'm just giving you background information so that in doing reading of that, you might run across these aspects. So, um, 
Yeah. Any questions, comments? Any questions besides, can we go for lunch now? <laughs> Okay, what's the system? And okay, that's really answered to Yeah. And that, that job can help me. <laughs> yeah. And even even as you begin here, it's like the first few chapters of Jeremiah seem to be just a whole compilation of a whole bunch of different prophetic messages given at different times. Mm -hmm. And they've just all been thrown together in one one grouping without even any giving any indication of, you know, this oracle ends or this prophetic speech ends. Now this is a brand new one given at another time. There's no indication of that at all. It just all now flows together. And so you move from one topic to another topic and back to a previous topic. And yeah. Wow. yeah that's... So it is... Yeah. People have tried to do that. Um, but I think a, a more literary approach to it is, is asking the questions, why have these oracles been put? Why, I use the term oracles for pro prophecies. Okay. Why have these been put together in the way that they have in the final form of the Bible as we have it? Uh, clearly, and we'll talk about this. Clearly, these, the incidents of Jehoiakim and Zedekiah, even though they're separated by years, have been placed together so that you see the contrast of the response of Jehoiakim, King Jehoiakim, and contrast to the response by King Zedekiah. In other words, literarily, they have been brought together for a purpose. Yeah. Um, but again, as I, I read this, I'm, I'm going, we're going to be talking more about what is the theology of this? What's the theology of judgment? What is the theology of restoration? And that type of thing. And, and yeah, how the conflict and confronting political leaders, is there a contemporary relevance to that? Mm -hmm. um, Yeah. <laughs> Let's put it this way. It was originally addressed to kings back then, but God continues to work the same way as he did. In other words, there's a consistency of the theology of who God is and how God works. And that in, in contemporary situations, we can apply that theology even though the situation, specifics of the situation are very different. Um, just one example and then I'll quit. Uh, and we're not going to have time, I don't think, to go over this. But Oracles Against the Nations, is a, there's a whole theology of how does God work with nations, political entities, which are not God's people. And I think that has direct theological relevance to how does God work in the world today with political entities? Not about how God works with his people, the church, but how does God work in the political realm of the world? And I think the oracles of nations give us a theological basis for that, but we, we never read those. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, we'll take a break until 2 o'clock, an hour break for lunch, and come back at 2. Yeah, and my intent is to do 45 minutes of lecturing, 15-minute break. That's my intent, so...